Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for inviting me to this GDG Johannesburg meetup. So uh, I'm going to talk about the DKMP architecture, uh, which uh, where D stand for declarative UIs and uh, KMP stand for Kotlin multi-platform. So it's a very special time for declarative UIs because last week uh, there was the announcement by Google that Jepe Compose, which is the new Android uh, UI toolkit, is in beta and uh, very soon probably within six months is going to be in the stable version version 1.0 so i think it's a very hot topic right now to know how to build up using declarative uis and especially with the kotlin multi-platform so we're going to talk about uh, also the mvi pattern so how so we believe that the mvi pattern is the best uh, pattern to mix declarative UI and Kotlin multi-platform. So let's go on with the talk and uh, hopefully you'll understand more about it. Okay, so uh, historically, typically apps uh, did not share, um, you know, apps on different platforms did not share any code between them. So if a company wanted to talk to, to build three apps, Android, iOS, and web, they would build three whole apps and, uh, which means also three times bug. But hopefully now with the new technology that is coming up uh, now, this year especially, we can do something much better. And uh, with the DKMP architecture, which I'm going to talk uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes, we are able to share 85% of our business logic, um, thanks to Kotlin multi-platform. And uh, we are able to have platform specific code, which is just the UI code. And uh, in terms of effort, of code effort is, if you, you know, roughly speaking, is even half than just building three whole apps if you want to target these three platforms. So let's go to see more in detail what the DKMP architecture is about. So as you can also see from the diagram, uh, there is a, the DUI layer and the business logic, which can be fully decoupled. And uh, you, we only share the business logic, which is, by the way, the biggest part of the, of the code, which is 85%. So it sounds like a very big number, but hopefully in the talk, you'll understand that the reason why this 85% is such a high number. And by not sharing the UI, we have also a lot of flexibility. So we have the flexibility to target not just iOS or Android or web, but even any other UI toolkit of any other platform. And this is different compared to other frameworks like Flutter or React Native, because they have their own UI framework. So if you decide to build with these two frameworks, then you would be locked into using their UI toolkits. And instead, if you use Kotlin multi-platform, uh, you have the flexibility to adapt your sh business logic, your share code uh, to any other platform. And this is a very important advantage. Uh, so let's go to see which are the three pillars of this DKMP architecture we'll be talking about today. So as we said, declarative UIs, and now we have uh, a declarative UI in Android, uh, which is called Japan Compose, which is going to become 1.0 by the end of, the, of this year. And uh, in iOS, we also have recently, since uh, 2009, since one and a half years, we have Swift UI, which has replaced uh, the uh, traditional UI kit in iOS. So the second pillar is the Kotlin multi-platform, which is a multi-platform technology, which finally makes sense and works. Uh, which is which we believe it's really a step forward compared to what cross-platform or multi-platform uh, used to be, uh, namely uh, Flutter or React Native or even C++. You know, uh, there are certain companies that uh, a few years ago, you know, started maybe ten years ago, they started to to build share code using, for example, C++. So now we finally have a technology which. Uh, is is really the best you can have at the moment because okay we will see this more in detail but you will be able to target uh, each platform specifically 
And then the third pillar is the MVI pattern. So the MVI pattern is uh, based on the unidirectional data flow and a single source of truth for the upstate and is not using, and we are going to show in our architecture that we are not using Rx Java for, for this, but we are using Kotlin. So we're using the new components that uh, Kotlin uh, less than one year ago made, made it made available. Okay, so before I start the, the, the proper talk, I want to thank all the people who made a lot of research on this topic, MVI, Kotlin Multiplatform, Declarative UIs. And in this presentation, what I'm going to do is to connect the dots between all this knowledge that has been shared through webinars or articles. And uh, so I'm connecting into this uh, architecture, which I call Deep DKMP. So let's go into more details. So this is a picture, a very simplified picture to picture what uh, app development has been in the past and what we really believe uh, very surely is gonna be in the future. And it's a future which is not that far away. It's a future which can already you know, start uh, now in 2021. Uh, so you would be one of the early adopters if you start this year. But uh, I, I'm pretty sure that next year there won't be any doubt that in architecture will be of, especially of greenfield apps would be structured like you see here in the future. So briefly speaking, uh, one of the main characteristic of uh, the future of apps, how I like to call it, is of course declarative UIs, uh, which compared to the previous uh, UI toolkits, are able to be fully decoupled from, from the view model, from the data. So if you think about Android development, uh, traditional Android development as it is now, you know that uh, whenever you make an XML layout uh, and you define components, you always need to associate, to define an ID for all these components. And if you want to apply data to all these components, you need uh, not just the data, but you need also an extra layer where you associate the data to the ID and then which which is able to couple to the XML layout components. So basically between the UI layout and the view model, there is always this extra layer of code. And this happens both in Android and in iOS. So to be more precise, if you think about find view by ID, is what exactly you need, you know, this layer of code to connect your data to the UI layout. And in the declarative UI, UI, UI layout, you, you don't have these at all. Actually, your components, they don't even have an IDs. And this already is a very, uh, you know, one of the first reasons why we are able to be, uh, to have such a, a thin UI layer, because the UI layer is stateless and, uh, fully decoupled from the, from the business logic. So one other characteristic of the future is that we'll be able to share uh, anything which is not the UI, basically. And uh, I was mentioning earlier, it would be 85%. Uh, and this is something very different than it was to be because when it was to be in the, in the past, because we tend not to share anything apart from web services, clearly. And then one other aspect, which is important to highlight is that by being able to share so much of the client, so basically we're able to share the whole business logic of the, of the client. In this way, we are able to put a lot more logic in, in the client. Before, we tended to develop apps which were thin client because it was very expensive to move any logic to the client. Expensive because any logic that you would put on the client, you would have to replicate for each platform. So when using, Kotlin multi-platform or yeah, multi-platform in general, but you know, in, in this particular case, Kotlin multi-platform. So you're able to write logic once. So you can put as much logic as you want. And putting logic in the client means also to improve the user experience a lot. So let's summarize. So in the past, we had a UI layout and, and view model, which required a coupling middle layer. So in the future, we would have a UI layout and a view model, which would be fully decoupled. So in the past, we tend not to share any code. In the future, we'll be able to share 85% of the code. 
So in the past, we had patterns like MVC, MVP, MVVM. In the future, we would have pattern like MVI with a single source of truth for, for the app state. And in the past, we tend to build apps as a thin client uh, because client side logic was very expensive. But in the, in the future, we'll be, be able to have a rich client uh, as the client side logic is inexpensive. So we can put lots, lots of more logic on the client. And uh, because this is what, what what is the reality. So the more logic that you're able to put in the client, the better user experience you're you're able to provide. Just you know, as an example, ha having no logic at all in a client, it would mean to, for example, query a web service, get the data from the web service, and presenting the data to the to the app as it is. And you know this means that uh, each each interaction you would need to wait for the data, and you know it's not such a great user experience. So if you put more logic in the client, you are able to be much more sophisticated, so that uh, uh, you don't just show anything that comes from the server, but you're able to process it, and you're able to compose in in any way you want. So you know this is a very important important equation. So the logic, the amount of logic in the client is really proportional to to the to the to the better user experience. Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, okay, one important assumption uh, we need to to make from the very beginning is that this DKMP architecture is aimed to greenfield projects. So our architecture is not about gradually introducing declarative UIs um, and KMP to existing project, but is to provide a clean, solid, and future-proof architecture, which is making no compromises with the past. And very important also to uh, highlight that uh, this DKMP is not a third-part library or a library, it's an architecture. So it is based on the official frameworks, on Jepa Compose, Swift UI, Kotlin Multiplatform. So there is nothing really extraneous or foreign or third party that you needs to be involved to build apps using this architecture. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the different layers of the app, uh, DKMP is structured to have a very neat separation of concerns. So if you analyze data, you know, uh, you know, you, we have the web services that would provide raw data. Then we would have uh, a data layer, which is uh, the layer which processes and does all the caching. Then we would have the view model, which uh, is the layer who's doing the formatting. And then we have the declarative UI, which is just uh, uh, visualizing all the data. So as you can already notice from here, so the app state, so the state of the app is something which is shared also, which is part of the view model as well. So for this reason, the declarative UI is, is a stateless UI. And this is the reason why it's able to be so thin. So we can do all our formatting, all our processing in the shared Kotlin multi-platform. And what is left is really a very thin layer. OK, so let's talk more in detail about this first pillar, which is the declarative UI. <clears throat> let's give a little bit of a timeline. So uh, declarative UIs became very popular on the web. And this was thanks to React.js, which is a framework uh, that was created by, by Facebook in 2011 and was open source in 2013. Then on mobile, declarative UIs, uh, First, uh, you know, the, the, the one of the first, probably the first experiments was with React Native, which was the uh, mobile version of React. But uh, definitely the most important experiment uh, uh, that has ever that has been so far is with Flutter. So Flutter is a framework uh, uh, written uh, in, in, you know, that you, you program in uh, using the Dart Ledger, Dart language, which um, is by Google. And I think Flutter has been really this uh, UI toolkit which show how declarative UIs made sense on mobile for the first time. And uh, thanks to the success of, of Flutter, the main two mobile framework also decided to have their own declarative UIs. 
And uh, so Google in May 2019 presented JEPA Compose as experimental. And then uh, in June 2019, um, Apple presented Swift UI as also the declarative UIs for iOS. One, one thing to note is that when Google presented uh, JEPA Compose, uh, he presented as experimental. And actually, in fact, we are now almost two years later, which is still better. And, and then we're going to be 1.0 by the end of this year. Uh, but it's curious to, to, to notice that Apple presented uh, from the blue this uh, Swift UI as version 1.0. So it was really unexpected. And uh, to be honest, you know, what they called version 1.0 was not really, really mature. But luckily, the year later, in June 2020, they presented version 2.0. And uh, is, now it's working very well, I would say, finally. Yeah. Uh, some, you know, briefly, some characteristic of declarative UIs. So they just describe how the UI looks like for the different app states. But they are stateless, so they don't manage the app state directly. And uh, they're able to achieve um, very neat decoupling between the, you know, we, we, thanks to declarative UI, we're able to have a very good decoupling from, from the view model, from, from the data, basically. Okay, let's now analyze uh, what we were, what I was um, expressing earlier. So, as I said, in the uh, imperative UI uh, toolkit, you always have. A, a, an extra layer of codes that is needed to couple data to the UI component. And this is in Android is find view by ID. Even though recently uh, in Android, we have view binding, which is trying to simplify and to eliminate uh, and to make it more simple to, to eliminate lots of boilerplate code. But even if you use view binding in Android, you still have somehow to couple the data you, need, you still need this extra layer to, to couple data to the layout. And similarly, in the UI kit in iOS, we also need to um, couple the code to, to the UI component. And in the declarative UIs, it's very different because we actually, as you can see, we actually don't have this extra layer of code. So in the declarative UI, you have your own view model, I mean, the data, and you are able to apply each field, uh, each, each, each element of, of your object, of your data object, directly on a, on a component, on a UI component, without using an ID at all. This also, as I say, is really, uh, you know, is very beneficial for removing a lot of boilerplate code. And also, you know, it removes lots of bugs at the same time. Uh, okay, so more in detail about the JPEG Compose for Android. So as I said, it was announced in May 2019 at Google I.O. And it reached alpha last year in August. And last week, was uh, it reached beta. And uh, we know for sure, because uh, the Compose team said that it's going to reach version 1.0 during this year. So we don't know actually when. It might be August. It might be November. They don't even know. but. You know, they promise that it's going to be by the end of the year. So we are really, really near. But actually, already in the beta version, uh, they the, the Compose team announced that the beta version is API stable. So all the improvements that are going to be from now to the stable version, they're just going to be performance improvements. So it's not, there's not any blocker at all to start coding with Jetpack Compose. Uh, one interesting characteristic of Jetpack Compose is that it just requires Android, point, uh, Android 5, so API 221. So this means that uh, you are able to use any, you know, the recent version of Jetpack Compose, uh, you know, with the existing devices. So and you don't need to target any later API for that. Uh, so basically, any update is going to be backward compatible uh, because Jetpack Compose is simply like uh, a great a library that you define in Gradle. So it's a bit like app compat. You just need to, if you want to use the latest version, you just upgrade the version and you're able to use it straight away there. And this is not the same in iOS with Swift UI because Swift UI is actually tied to the iOS framework. So this means that if you want to use the latest Swift UI version, your app, your iOS app needs to target the latest 
iOS framework version. So there is no backward compatibility. And uh, let's talk about the web now. So uh, Kotlin uh, for the web uh, has got very convenient wrappers for React. So this means that you are able to write your UI for the web uh, using React components and without even need to even even the need to use JavaScript, but you can just use Kotlin. And this is very convenient, especially for people who are really into React and they they like and they're familiar with uh, React components. But it's probably even more interesting, even though we are just at the beginning. So it's just experimental at the moment. So experiments started just a few months ago. That would be Compose for Web, which is the web version of Jetpack Compose for Android. So we can expect that the API will be very similar, probably not, not identical, but very similar to Jetpack Compose. So if you think about, we have 85% of shared business logic and then just 15% of the UI toolkits. So in, for Compose for Web, instead of 15% extra uh, code, you would probably just have 5% because most of this code would be the same as for Android. So basically, you would be able to build a web app almost for free, which is clearly a, a really good uh, perspective for all developer. And in the future, we can expect that Compose for Web would be compiled uh, to WebAssembly that, that we believe is going to be the future for the web. So we expect that in the future, we will have two families for declarative UIs. So one family would be JetPack Compo uh, Compose, we, we call it usually, which is by Google and, and JetBrains. And you, you would be able to build apps for Android, uh, for desktop. Actually, it's already possible now. There are previews for Compose for desktop that is able to target uh, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS, so all basically desktop operating systems and web that we hopefully we hope that is going to progress quickly and we're going to have hopefully by the end of the year some good uh, you know version that is is possible to use and uh, we can expect also for uh, Wear OS and Google TV and then we will have the we have already Swift UI by by Apple and with this Swift UI you are able to already build up seamlessly for iOS, macOS, watchOS, and tvOS. Basically, the same component that you define in SwiftUI, uh, it's up to the framework uh, to render up, uh, accordingly. Uh, you know, uh, uh, if you are on the phone, it's going to render in a certain way. If you are on, on your Mac, in another way, if you are on the phone. So, and with the same API, with the same components. So this is very interesting. So we can expect even Compose uh, with the other, with Wear OS or Google TV is going to do something very similar to what it's already uh, doing uh, Apple with Swift UI. Okay, so now let's uh, show a, vi a video, which is a very short video. So last week, there was this very important event by Google where they announced uh, the beta version of JPEG Compose. And during uh, this beta version, there were very interesting news. And, and yeah, I'll show you this video. Uh, I'm not sure the, view, the volume is very good, so probably you should turn up the volume if it's not too loud. Jetpack Compose, you know, sets us up for the next 10 years. Um, and more than that, I think it's it's a flexible toolkit. And so it's not just for phones, but I think it's going to be for lots of form factors like watches, wearables, TV, auto, uh, tablets, laptops. Um, and so I think it's going to serve as well. Yeah, so basically we have a, an official confirmation by Dave Burke, which is the vice president of Android engineering, that Compose is not ju just going to be for phones, but it's going to also be for wearables, TV, auto, and laptops. I mean, this is not very surprising, but uh, it's the first time that we hear from some, some official source like this. So we can really be safe learning Japan Compose, thinking that it's going to be the, U the UI toolkit for the next 10 years. And uh, yeah, okay. So here I show very briefly some code uh, of JPEG Compose and SwiftUI. You can see these uh, are very similar. Uh, 
the concept of declarative UI, which are stateless. So as you can see, as I was mentioning also earlier, you don't see any IDs here, right? So what you see, okay, so I explain what it is, sorry, more in detail. So in Japan Compose, we have a component which is called a row, which is the equivalent of a horizontal linear layout in the traditional Android UI. And then we have uh, three text elements inside this, this layout. And uh, similarly, in Swift UI, we have this other component, which is called HStack, which is exactly the same thing, the equivalent of row. And you also see you have three text elements inside. So you see these text elements, uh, and not even the other linear layout uh, um, elements, they don't have any IDs. So we are able to apply the data object. So in this case, it's the row object directly on the element and this is a, a really very important simplification which is already eliminating lots of boilerplate code comparing to the traditional ui toolkits uh, okay so let's now talk about the second pillar kotlin multi-platform and let's give some timeline as well so kotlin multi-platform uh, started experimentally in november 2017 so we are talking about three and a half years ago, basically. So at the beginning, we as uh, just with JavaScript, and then uh, there was added support for iOS in February two thousand and eighteen with Kotlin one point two point twenty. Then it became Alpha in August two thousand twenty with Kotlin one point four. And then now uh, I think some of you already know that Kotlin now is going to have a new release every six months. So we're gonna have uh, Kotlin 1.5 in the second quarter of 2021 and Kotlin 1.6 in the fourth quarter. So we don't know exactly you know, when it's gonna be beta or, uh, or stable, but we expect at least it's gonna be beta for sure by, by Kotlin 1.6 and who knows, maybe even stable, who knows. But what is important to say is that uh, the, the stage of Kotlin multi-platform is already very, uh, you know, very stable, I would say, in terms of API, at least. So, um, you know, you, you can really start working with Kotlin multi-platform and you wouldn't have any blocker. So, of course, JetBrain is going to make improvements and, and you know, there's going to be a beta and a stable version. But most of these improvements, they're going to be mainly under the hood. So there's nothing really that, that stops you from starting working, uh, using it and to build your own apps. And uh, in terms of JPEG Compose and Swift UI, uh, as we said, we, you know, it's, it reached beta last week, and uh, JPEG Compose is going to uh, become 1.0 by the end of this year. And Swift UI is already 2.0, and uh, in June with the WWDC 2021, uh, there's going to be the third version. Okay, so uh, this is a very important thing. So. We tend to use the, the word Kotlin multi-platform as if Kotlin multi-platform was different from Kotlin. But actually, the best thing to say is that Kotlin is multi-platform because Kotlin uh, now it's fully a multi-platform language. So Kotlin started as a JVM language. And uh, we know that in 2017, Google announced it uh, as a first class language for, for Android. And then in 2019, actually it became, you know, the, the preferred language for, for Android. So definitely Kotlin started as a JVM language, but now is progressing, you know, any new feature that is added now to Kotlin is added across all platform. So we cannot, you know, we cannot uh, define Kotlin a JVM language anymore. It is definitely is a multi-platform language. And so it's able to compile to JVM and uh, for Android or for server side, as we saw already a talk uh, earlier on during this uh, meetup. And uh, it's able to be, we can compile it to native if we want to target to iOS or macOS or Windows or Linux or we are able to compile to JS if we want to target the web. And then there's gonna be a four target, which is gonna come possibly in 2022, which is going to be WebAssembly. 
Okay, so all the codes of the business logic that we write in Kotlin multi-platform, it's compiled to a library. And uh, let's see which are the formats, the compilation formats for uh, the different platform. So in Android, our business logic is compiled as a jar file, which is a you know, totally native uh, format for, for the Android platform. In iOS, it's uh, compiled as a Objective-C framework, which is also fully native. And then for the web, it's compiled as a JS library. And let's now compa uh, compare the DKMP framework uh, architecture to Flutter and React Native. So uh, as we already mentioned, the user interface we write natively, uh, JPEG Compose for Android and Swift UI for iOS, while on Flutter and React Native, you would use their own native um, proprietary widgets. In terms of business logic, for DKMP, you would use simply the Kotlin language. And for Flutter, the Dart language. <clears throat> and for React Native, the JavaScript language. And now, more interestingly, let's see how it runs. So we already saw <clears throat> earlier that uh, uh, so we have the UI that is native because we build with the native toolkits, Jepa Compose and Swift UI, and we have the business logic, which is also have which also has a native format. So in Android, we the business logic is a jar library, and in iOS is an Objective C framework, which is <clears throat> and in in Flutter is not as native at all. So first of all, in Flutter we don't have native UIs because uh, the UI uh, looks the same uh, in Android and, and uh, in iOS, and uh, is based on the Skia graphic engine. And uh, it's compiled for Android as an NDK app, and uh, in iOS as an LLVM. And in React Native, yeah, we have native UI, that's true. But uh, the business logic actually runs as JavaScript and is able to uh, interface to the framework thanks to a C, C++, C, C++ bridge. <clears throat> so if you compare all these three platforms, you can see very easily that in terms of nativeness, there is not really any comparison. What is more, what, what is the most native out of the three? But also in terms of bundle size. So using the DKMP architecture, by far you would have the smallest bundle side at all. And so, I mean, you choose yourself what you like, but I have my own preference. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, Kotlin multi-platform acronyms because sometimes people, they get confused because they see several acronyms and they don't understand what they refer to. So recently, uh, JetBrains introduced a new acronym, which is KMM, which is basically Kotlin multi-platform for mobile. And is something, is an acronym that you use to refer just to mobile, just to Android and iOS. And uh, also in August, JetBrains released a very, very useful uh, plugin, which is called KMM plugin for Android Studio. And thanks to this plugin, uh, which is incredibly convenient, you are able to run iOS apps directly on Android Studio. So, in this way, you barely need Xcode at all because uh, although you need Xcode installed for, for iOS, but Android Studio is just connecting through Xcode and, and you just need it installed. You don't really, if you don't want, you don't need to actually even open Xcode at all, you know, for running both Android and iOS apps. And uh, the KMP is a more general acronym to mean any Kotlin multi-platform, including desktop and web. Okay, in terms of JavaScript, uh, there is something very use interesting which is coming up uh, by the end, hopefully by the end of uh, this year, 2021, which is the new IR backend for Kotlin JavaScript. And this is going to bring a, ver a lot of improvement, uh, especially on the bundle size. And there's going to be a very, very, very important milestone for, for KMP on the web. So we believe that uh, uh, when this new IR backend uh, it's stable, uh, you know, it's going to make it very, very feasible uh, to to ship in production web apps written in Kotlin. So many would would ask, so is so is this technology ready? And uh, my answer is 
definitely ready for uh, Android and iOS in the sense that you can definitely start developing. If you, you know, for shipping production, probably makes sense to wait, uh, you know, maybe a few months more, you know, sometime in the second half of 20, 2021, I would say you would probably have no any, any real problem uh, to ship up in productions. Uh, in terms of web, uh, personally, I mean, I would be very interested in Compose for web. So, so I mean, my idea is that it makes sense to start, you know, First of all, doing this 85% of business logic, then you know, releasing, uh, targeting Android and iOS UI. And then after you've done all that, yeah, you can start, uh, hopefully at that time, there's gonna be Compose for web, and then you just need to add this 15% or even less on top, and then you would have also the web app. And for the web, I would say, yeah, it makes sense probably to, to wait 2022, but you, know, you don't need to, wait, to lose any of this time because you would be busy in, in this time, already building the rest of the app. Okay, let's now talk about the third pillar, which is the MVI pattern. So the MVI pattern is typically referred as the evolution of the MVVM pattern, which is the pattern which is the most common in Android, in current Android development. So it's based on a unidirectional data flow and on uh, the app state, uh, which is the single source of truth uh, for, for the whole app. So uh, in interactional data flow, it means that, uh, for example, if the view wants to make a change to the state, it cannot do it directly, but it needs to follow the loop, the unidirectional data flow. And, uh, you know, and then now we see, can see more in detail in the next slides. Uh, so the MVI pattern, as I said, is, is based on the single source of truth for the UI layer, which is the app state. And it consists on immutable data. So the app state needs to be immutable because at any one time, the UI layer should be able to render uh, the data into, into the UI layer. And uh, the app state can only be modified by the view model. And following a unidirectional data flow. So let's make an example. So you would have an app, and uh, from the UI, the, you would have an user, a user that triggers an event or intent, as you want to call it. And then uh, the view model uh, through the state reducer would change the app state, would make modification to the app state. And then the, the view will be able to apply the new app state. And now we have another video. So uh, you can turn up the volume if it's too lo uh, low. The state management is one of the most important things for an application. And uh, we felt from the beginning that it was important for Compose to, to work well with a, a variety of state management solutions. And so Compose doesn't in particular uh, kind of make anything too difficult for, for existing solutions. Um, you know, the Android ecosystem has really been moving recently towards uh, the destruction of, of MVI. And the, the MVI pattern works really well with Compose. Yeah, so from the words of uh, the Compose team, so also Leland Richardson is mentioning that MVI is a particularly good pattern to work with uh, JPEG Compose and to declarative UIs in general. So, okay. Yeah, so. Uh, specifically in our architecture, the DKMP, uh, uh, th we have state flow that is enabling our MVI pattern. So state flow was released uh, in May 2020 as part of Kotlin, Kotlin Coroutine 1.3.6. And, and so state flow is, is enabling a multi-platform MVI pattern, which is, uh, uh, you know, typically you know, if you if you read the early MVI pattern articles on Android, you always see mentioned RxJava. So now, thanks to Stateflow, we are able to achieve a multi-platform MVI pattern as a multi-platform. So not using platform-specific um, components, but something which is actually part of the Kotlin language. And it's working wherever Kotlin is working, which is, at the moment, really everywhere. So there's no probably platform that uh, Kotlin is not able to compile to. 
And uh, in our DKMP architecture, uh, state flow is able to propagate the, uh, the up state from the view model to the LA. So you can see also from the diagram here, and you see also uh, reported here state flow. So state flow is able to propagate this up state from the view model to, to the UI layer. And this is actually his role, his function. <clears throat> so he's, a, he's an observer. You can define it as an observer as well. So let's see how the app state is organized. So in our app, we, of course, we tend to have many screens. So it makes sense that our app state is organized in substates where each substate is referring to a specific screen. So this gives a very good modular architecture and way of organizing our, our data in our app. So let's see how the view model is like. So the view model is actually a, a Kotlin class. And as you can see, uh, is a class which has state flow as a property which is you know what makes everything happens you know propagating the data to the ui but as you can see this state flow is a computed property and only has a getter and no setter this is because one of the requirements of uh, mvi pattern is that uh, the app state should be immutable so it should not be modifiable so how do we modify the the state yeah we can we still can uh, so we cr we use another components which we call state manager, and this state manager is a is is got as a property the mutable state flow, which is actually the read write version of state flow, and as you see the getter is just getting uh, the data from mutable state flow. You can see that both state flow and mutable state flow has the up state as its type because this is what they are propagating. They are propagating the object, which is the app state. And also the state manager has uh, a property, you know, as the data repository, the, repo, the repo as a property. So let's see in the detail these two elements, which are the events and the state reducers, how they are defined. So the events, we define them as extension functions of the view model and the state reducers we define as extension function of state manager. So it's as, as simple as that. So we define these two class, view model and state manager, and the two elements that we have to deal with, they're just extension functions of these two models. So, but let's see more in detail so we understand even better. Okay, no, one, one question. So you might ask, you might question why extension functions are not methods. So because methods, they need to be inside the same file. So extension functions, you are able to define in different files, you know? So, and this is very handy for uh, organizational purposes because in our um, file, uh, file system, in, uh, you know, in the view model, we can define two folders, one events and one state reducers. And inside of each folder, we can create a file for each screen. So one for home, one for profile, one for settings. And we can group all the events, which as we say, they are extension functions. So they could be split across different files. And uh, in this way, you know, it makes the our apps architecture and organization very simple and very clean. Okay, so talking more in detail about the state reducer. So the role of the state reducer is to create the new state and uh, is able uh, to do that by combining three different inputs. One is the uh, user event parameters, one is the repository, and one is the current app state. So if we, with an example, we can understand better. So this is an app, even if it doesn't look like, but uh, think about this is an app with a list and several items. And uh, there is a user which is clicking on one item, let's say on the on the city, Berlin. So what's happening now in our app is that we are calling an event. And as we defined earlier, and we 
as we said earlier, we define events as extension functions of the view model. And this is actually what it is. You know, this select city, it's an event function, so it's an extend function of the view model. So looking inside of this function, you see that you have actually two state reducers. So what are state reducers? So we already introduced it. So state reducers are what are able to create a new state. So we can see that in this select city, we have two state reducers, which means that there's gonna be two times is gonna happen that the state of the app is changing. And the state changing also means, you know, each, each uh, state change triggers uh, a new screen, you know, a change also on the UI. So because actually, when we, in, the, in, in this uh, sample app, what we are doing is that we are clicking on an element and we want to load some data. But before loading some data and, you know, and getting some data, we actually want to display a loading screen. And this is what this state reducer is doing, the set loading state reducer. So we just click and then we call this state reducer, which is what, what is doing is just changing a flag, our is loading flag from false to true. And uh, this triggers a change in our UI, which is you know, displaying a simple loading screen. And then inside our event function, what we are doing is that we are uh, triggering a, um, uh, you know, asynchronously, you know, we, we just uh, launch a, a coroutine and uh, asynchronously we are going to load the data from, from the repository which is inside this set details data. And what, what we are doing in this case is that we are, once this state uh, uh, reducer is executed, what is doing is that is setting the new data to a new element and then is reverting the is loading flag so that we are not showing that loading screen anymore. Let's see more in detail, you know, specifically how this set loading and set detail data are composed so we understand even better. So this set loading, what it's doing is using uh, the Kotlin copy function. So the Kotlin copy function is a, is a function which you can use on uh, data classes. And what it's doing is that it's basically able to uh, modify mutable data, which sounds uh, you know absurd, but that's what it is. Because what it's doing under the hood, this copy, is that it's duplicating an object and on the duplicated object is setting some new elements. So in this case, we are just basically changing one uh, property, the is loading property. So, and this is what is happening, ju just that in the set loading function. While in the set detail data function, we are also doing something more, something else. So we are also fetching, you know, we are calling a function on our repository, on our repo, and then, getting this data uh, so we get this data and then we modify you know the property where we want to set this data on the app state and then also the other setting so let's recap what the state reducer is doing so as we say state reducer is a state manager extension function and is, as we said earlier, is using three different inputs. So one is the user event parameter. So in our case, it's the Berlin uh, you know, input uh, for, from our item. And actually is also the uh, parameter, the input parameter for, for this uh, state reducer function itself. Then another input is the repository, which is actually coming from the state manager because we said earlier that re the repository is one property of the state manager and the state reducer is an extension function of the state manager so it has access to the repository object and the third uh, element uh, input is the current app state and here for simplicity what we are doing is we are creating a computed property because our app state what it is is actually is actually is the value of our mutable state flow but uh, in order to write in a more simple way, we are creating the state uh, computed property so that uh, we are able to, to write state equal state.copy. Otherwise, we would have to write mutable state flow.value equal to mutable state flow.value.copy. So this is just for simplicity. We are creating the computed property and the code looks much, much neater. 
And so by executing this copy function, we are able to create a new app state. Okay, so let's now mention about the data layer. So the data layer consists of a repository, the repo, uh, which connects to different uh, sources. And this could be of any kind. So you could think about any different kind of data of any kind. Uh, it could be web services, GraphQL, run, runtime objects, platform settings, um, real-time databases, anything. Uh, so the repo is our central, uh, you know, data bank somehow, which is organized, which is connecting and storing anything which is coming from the different sources. So it's also the component that is organizing the data cache caching of the of our app. And uh, if you think about that, uh, this data, I mean, this code here, it can just be written once and applied to any platform. Okay, so we don't, we can, you know, do anything, comp anything we want, even more complex things because we don't need to replicate anything. So we could think about uh, the most sophisticated data caching mechanism with all this, incredible logic and there's nothing stopping us from doing that because this is the only place where we have to write we don't have to replicate across all different platforms and uh, so you know the the function of the data layer is to provide the data as we saw already in the state reducer is through function is providing unformatted data to the state reducers and then you know which is the one who's also dealing with the formatting and then I want to mention something else about uh, GraphQL. So I believe GraphQL is a great fit for uh, Kotlin multi-platform in general for anything that has, which is a server-side database data. So if you want to deal with, with server-side database data, uh, it's very simple to use something like GraphSQL because it's a very flexible protocol which allows you to uh, it allows the client to fetch the data and to decide which are the data to fetch rather than the web services deciding and defining for you which are the data. So this also goes perfectly in the direction of rich client, which, uh, which I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, which is the direction of providing a lot of freedom and power to the client. And at the same time, also moving as much logic as possible, as, as many decisions as possible from the server towards the client. And uh, so in this way, eventually the client, the, the server would just focus just on data provision and data availability, and it would be the client. So the client uh, developer who would easily, without any blocker, been able to test all different data combination uh, as he wants. And uh, for KMP, we already have a working client, uh, which is a you know Graph, GraphQL Apollo client, which is probably the most famous GraphQL client anyway. So it's already available for uh, KMP, even though it's experimental. And then uh, this is the last slide of my talk. And uh, this is like a summary of the libraries that we, you would use with the DKMP architecture. So obviously, in this multi-platform, you would not be able to use uh, platform-specific libraries anymore, even if it's not true totally, because some of these uh, libraries that you see, multi-platform libraries, uh, actually, they do use platform-specific um, libraries, but they just wrap it. For example, uh, multi-platform settings is uh, a multi-platform uh, library for you know dealing with local settings and what it's doing is just wrapping in each platform the native library that is doing that so in android it's shared preferences and in ios is ns user defaults and uh, also Ktor client which is actually the most important client uh, for uh, kmp which has been um, you know, released, uh, uh, developed by JetBrains. What it's doing is that under the hood is wrapping the native HTTP client on Android and the native HTTP, HTTP client for iOS. Then let's mention, okay, we already mentioned Stateflow, which is our observable 
So we would use these instead of live data in Android or combine in iOS. And uh, for serialization, we would use Kotlin serialization, which is also developed by JetBrains. For structured data, we wouldn't use Room or Core Data, but you would, we would use SQL Delight, which is a library developed by Square. And for concurrency, we would use Coroutines, which is, by the way, also what uh, normal Android developments should use nowadays. Okay, so this was the last slide. And if you want to know more about this architecture, you can read my article, which I published a few weeks ago on Medium. Uh, you can type my name or the future of apps, DKMP, you can easily find it. And if you have any questions, just uh, drop me a message, direct message with Twitter. But also, if you have questions right now, uh, you are feel free to answer, and I hope you will be able, you know, feel free to ask, and I hope I will be able to answer you straight away.